Follow with me as I read from the Word of God. Actually, very difficult words from Jesus, but words that reveal his heart. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father, Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. When I read a parable like that, understanding that it has really one point that we'll get to in a moment, I try to put myself into the minds of the characters, the players, if you will. So let's try to get inside the mind of the rich man. It's very possible because of his opulence, the security that attended that opulence, and his own style of life, it's, it's really possible that the rich man never even saw Lazarus. But for the sake of our imagining, and to get me into the story and you into the story, let's assume that he did at least notice. If he saw Lazarus, he didn't give him the kind of notice that would have done him any good. And I have to confess to you this morning that I am the rich man and that I have been the rich man in attitude. And so, with that in mind, possibly the rich man thought, who is this bum? Why is he here at my gate? He must be a rank sinner, living in the depths of depravity by his own choice. What could possibly happen to a person to get them in this shape? How could he let his life go to this extent? Why doesn't he get a job? Why is he here bothering me? He must really like to be on the street. In fact, maybe he wants to be there. It's the choice he's making that's gotten him there. So why should I intervene? It's his life. And then I try to get into the mindset of Lazarus. And I know from friendships that I've developed that Lazarus has one goal. He wants to eat because he's starving to death. The text says that he longed for the crumbs that fell off the table of the rich man. I envision him at the back of the house by a gate going through the trash, 
looking for something to consume. And the text indicates that he longed for, but his longing was not realized. And so he had nothing to eat and he was hungry. The dogs did better than he as they licked the nourishment off the sores on his body. It's a very graphic parable. I have known both of these people. As I said a moment ago, unfortunately, I have been the rich man because compared to many of my friends, I live in opulence. I've never been Lazarus. I expect we have some people in this great hall that have been. The rich man's riches are hard to comprehend. The language here describes clothing and material that makes the clothing that harkens back to some of the tapestries in the temple itself. This man is ex extremely wealthy. He, he is incredibly well positioned. And one of the interesting things about people like him is that no one ever really questions why he was so rich. We rush to question what's behind Lazarus' problem. But no one ever says, how did this guy get this kind of wealth? And no one hardly ever says, might there be a connection between his wealth, his riches, his privilege, and the condition of Lazarus? That's an important question to ask if we're talking about a revival and a rebellion of justice. Lazarus, on the other hand, was incredibly ill. The street had broken him, compromised his health extremely. He presents evidence of possibly the end stages of diabetes. Certainly, his life has been physically neglected. He's probably on his last leg. But even more than that, he is defined as a problem. I wonder how that feels. To ask day after day for help and to be rebuffed. To cry out in deep need and despair and yet to be avoided, refused again and again. What must it do to a psyche to watch people walk around to get away from an encounter with you because of your terrible poverty and because they don't understand? About a year ago, City Square participated in a health vulnerability survey as a part of the 100,000 Homes campaign that is a national movement to provide 100,000 new homes to homeless people in America by 2016. We got up early in the morning and we were under the bridges with an eight-page survey, a health index, at 4 a.m. We were out there three mornings in a row under the I-45 bridges. We went early in the morning because we knew that we would be dealing with people who were shelter-resistant the hardest to house, and also the most vulnerable. We surveyed almost 300 individuals during that three-day effort. And we discovered 108 people who were in serious jeopardy of dying under the bridges in Dallas, Texas. End-stage renal failure, Hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, alcoholism, drug addiction. People so weakened and compromised that every time I read this text, I think of that experience. I have a friend named Roger who told me before he got his housing. He said, Larry, my life is like one unending parade day after day after day. If I'm in a shelter, I'm out early. If I'm not in a shelter, I'm up early. And I make a circuit that lasts the entire day, and I focus on three things. My mission includes what shall I eat, 
Where shall I relieve myself? And can I find a place simply to rest along the way? My life is a constant, unending parade. Or I think of my friend Wendy. I'm not sure how old Wendy is. I'm sure she's younger than she looks. Her hair is always a matted mess. She lives in an abandoned house in South Dallas with no utilities, but she's grateful for the roof that's over her head. She's incredibly shelter-resistant because she's been so abused. She has no real reason to ever be happy, and yet every time I drive up to where I know she's going to be, she bounds out of that house with a smile on her face. She doesn't want anything except just to find a friend. Or listen to this gentleman in the clip that we're going to play. My name is Ronald Davis. I've been on the street for about a year and a half now. Well, I come from the suburbs. Life, you know, which is, 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 is rough. And uh, I mean, I didn't slept in the lower whacker. I didn't slept on the bridges. I didn't slept in the, the little cardboard boxes and stuff, you know, just surviving, especially in the wintertime is the hardest time. And like, uh, I go to a few lot of applications for a job and stuff. They look at me, you know, I'm not looking presentable. And then they, well, we'll call you, leave a number. But how can I leave a number when I don't have a phone? So I, it's just a struggle out there. You know, I just, you know, from day to day, people, uh, I come out here and panhandle with my cup right here at the Metro train station. People come off bringing me sandwiches and stuff like this here. And uh, I start out in my morning about 6 o'clock. You know, sometimes I don't even have enough to go to the flop house. You know, sometimes the flop house is a cheap place and they number 16 bucks for 24 hours right over there on Clark and Van Buren. And uh, a lot of times I don't have enough money for that, so I had to end up sleeping in the park or on one of these benches downtown or something like this. And then the security guards come and run you off about 5 or 6 in the morning. So by 6 o'clock I started the panhandling and trying to survive. And uh, like I said before, some days I don't even have enough to get a room, so I just sleep on the sleep street. But I depend on the people that's coming off the train because most of them I give them respect. You know, most of them like me. They come out and give me clothes and food and stuff like this here, so I can survive. Give me a few bucks and everything, and I add it up at the end of the day and get me a little room for the night. And whenever I'm not fortunate enough to get the room, I just sleep in the street wherever I can. It's really humiliating to be shaking a cup. 24 hours a day and people just look at you like you're some kind of little bomb, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I have had people to walk past me and say, get a job, bomb. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not a bomb, I'm a human being. And it's, and it's hard. But after the end of the day, when, when people go home and everybody get on the metro train and then my and then I just feel so bad that I can't be going home, you know. I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, it's really emotional because I'm really trying to get myself together and get off this tree, you know. And I don't care what it's doing. If I can get a job and through this humidity. You know, I mean, you just lose all your humility when you're shaking a cook bag. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, you know, I mean, you know, you can look at a person and tell if they give you respect or not. You know what I mean? A lot of people look at you like you're just a, a piece of crumb. You know, I had one guy walk past me and talk about me so bad, and then I just looked at him. I said, "God bless you, sir." He walked past and went, went down the street, come right back. He said, you know what, man, I had a bad day. He said, I'm sorry for even calling you that. He said, because I know you're a human being. He said, would you accept my part? I said, a part of deceptive. He went in his pocket and gave me 30 bucks and said, go get you a room and get you something to eat. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, no matter what people think about me, I know I'm a human person. And just because I'm down on my luck, don't give nobody no excuse to call me no ball because I'm not. To quote the eminent community philosopher, Gomer Pyle, 
Surprise, surprise, surprise. God loves Lazarus and brings him home. And the homecoming of Lazarus is just a little image of a theme that runs through the entire gospel, especially in Luke's gospel. And that is that this person, Jesus, has come to turn everything upside down. This parable is told because of what Jesus says in Luke 16, 9. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon, i.e. money, so that you will be welcomed in into the pearly gates by those you help. And the Pharisees were so hard-headed that Jesus had to make it plain. So in this parable, he breaks it down for them. It reminds me of the beautiful song that Mary sang before Jesus was born in Magnificat, where she sings of those with power being brought down and those who are powerless being lifted up, with the poor and the hungry being filled with good things and the rich being sent away empty-handed. This is the nature of the rebellion of Jesus. In chapter 12, verse 33 Jesus turns to his followers, many of whom were poor, and he says even to them, sell your possessions and give alms. Make a purse for yourself. that will never be damaged or wear out. Lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. Come and follow me. Luke 14, 12 to 14, there's this wonderful description of a feast that a friend of Jesus has. He leans over to him in the midst of the meal and he says, you know, the next time you do this, don't invite your friends and your neighbors and your family members, but invite the poor, the lame, the halt, the blind. Invite those people who can't pay you back like your friends and neighbors and family members can and probably would. Invite those who can't pay you back because you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. There's a great day coming. And an awful lot of it's going to be concerned with the conversation about mercy and justice and how we've responded to the very poor. I mean, the text kind of ends with Lazarus going home. But the conversation continues. Lord, can't you send Lazarus over here to give me just a little, little drink of water? Probably the same thing Lazarus would ask him on this side. And he had been denied can't come. There's a, there's a great chasm between us. No one comes or goes. Well, then can't you send Lazarus back to my father's house to warn my five brothers? Well, no, they've already been warned. They have Moses and the prophets. No, but they won't listen to Moses and the prophets. And even when they read Moses and the prophets, they read them in a way that's self-interested. They read around all the challenging text. That sounds familiar. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, surely they'll listen if someone is risen from the grave and goes back. No, they won't even listen if someone comes back from the grave. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Jesus, of course, knew Moses and the prophets, and he preached Moses and the prophets. And the people of God would be well advised to do the same today. And so what are the takeaways? They're pretty clear and they're real simple. God sees Lazarus and God cares for Lazarus. God pours out his grace on Lazarus, just like he pours out his grace on me and on you. And you know what? It doesn't even matter how or why Lazarus got there. It may have, all, it may have been all his fault. The grace of God applies there just as clearly and just as powerfully as it applies to the darkness of my heart. And so our journey through this life ought to be to reflect that kind of love 
that's, that grows out of an understanding that God cares for and stands with the weakest and the worst. Someone told me the other day, or I read it, if you want to find Jesus, go where sin is. And I believe that's true. Go where failure is. Go where brokenness is. Because God stands there among those who are humiliated by loss. And then the second takeaway is how I use my privilege and how I use my advantage, and I am very privileged and I am very advantaged, is a reflection of the depth and sincerity and the vibrancy of my faith. And if my faith does not lead me into the darkness of the world, I need to stop and take, take stock. Because this text says that faith will join God in his great revolution. We know in Dallas County the names of the 250 most expensive homeless people to the county. And by that I mean we know the names of the people who used, used most of the homeless services at Parkland Health and Hospital System, both inpatient and outpatient. We, we know those who use the most mental health dollars who are homeless. We know those who use the most jail dollars who are homeless. The cost to the county, not counting the city or not counting any nonprofit costs, the cost to the county per person averages $40,000 a year to keep people on the streets. We're joining together with you and other churches to build 50 homes in a gated community for 50 of the most expensive homeless people in Dallas County. The Cottages Project will be the first project ever to screen people in, not out. And we can provide high-touch, loving, Christian concierge services and robust psychiatric care for less than $15,000 a year once we get these houses built. 